go through something that we've done a, we've done once before where we kind of turned our sanctuary here with you guys into something a little bit different and uh, you're going to hear from pastor jim today there's a handout in front of you we have all sorts of stuff that we're going to get into so as you guys uh, get seated uh, i'm going to share with you one uh, update if i can about the normandy project fundraiser so how many of you guys have heard us talk about it? You're connected, you kind of follow the Normandy Project, and so you can uh, go online to the normandyproject.org to find out more. But we had a 45-day sprint from November 17th to December 31st uh, for giving for our Normandy Project. So do you guys want to hear what our grand total was? Yes. If we can, do we have a slide for this? This is going to be a real bummer if they, if they say no. So our grand total for our 45-day year-end giving sprint was not the newcomer's dessert on January 14th. It was a different one. All right, I'm just going to tell you, it was 60, over $65,000. Come on, Jesus. So I want to thank you guys for your faithful giving. We had a matching donor. We had those that just catalyzed and, and really rallied around that number. And so that was a huge, huge victory for us. And so I've gotten some questions. Uh, about our giving campaign, and you guys can see it over my head, we are most likely gonna do another one probably in the spring, we're, we're, we're planning it. So we've had questions like, hey, can I be a matching donor? Just hang tight, we're gonna do another one here, uh, and just make it part of our, our environment because we have a long way to go, but it's sprints like this, it's donations like this that get us to where we're going. And so I just wanna thank you guys because so many of you gave sacrificially, so many of you gave uh, just being prompted by the Lord. So thank you guys so much. This is a yay God, $65,000 in 45 days. I like those numbers. I would like that every 45 days. I just think that's a good idea. But uh, So thank you guys so much. Um, so the this morning, like I said, we're doing something a little bit different, and I'm going to uh, invite up Jen and Brian Lacosco. So they are our pastors of our revival community groups, and so uh, Brian and Jen have been championing and leading these communities that uh, you're going to see information to lobby about, uh, as, as well as on our website. You can see where all the groups are, uh, where they meet, and, and reach out to learn more. So I'm going to let Brian and Jen come up and give us a little bit of a highlight here of revival community groups. Thank you, sir. Good morning, everybody. And it's so good to see you all. This is Jen. Hi. Hi, I'm Jen. A lot of breath. Chasing children. Chasing down a nurry, which is always awesome. Hey, it is just really, really good to see you guys. Happy New Year. It's so good to see you. It's so good to be here. Quick question for you. How many of you uh, sitting in the chairs today, if you could stand up for me if you are an RC leader, revival community leader, why don't you just stand to your feet. I just want to get everybody, just take a look around and see these awesome people and just stay standing for just a second. So what you're seeing with these different folks, these are different people that have said with Pastor Jim and Mary, they said, you know what? We want to run with the vision that you have cast here at Zion. We hear your heartbeat with Acts chapter 2. We hear what you've said about taking the gospel into the streets, into the neighborhoods, into the communities, into the highways and the byways, the hedges, and just out into where people live. Because how many of you know that it's not the norm necessarily for people to just walk by a church building and go, huh, I think I want to go there. That's just not the norm. The norm is for the church to be out in the community finding those people, finding the ones who have the stirring on the inside of their hearts. Scripture says that God has placed eternity in the hearts of men, and it's when you and I as the church are finding that eternity that's brewing, that's bubbling, that's stirring, that's moving on the inside of men and women, and each of these different awesome, amazing, oh gosh, these people are so stinking fantastic, these different revival community leaders. Each time that we connect with those different folks, a kingdom connection is made and heaven rejoices. And we want to make sure that you have an opportunity to get connected and get linked in to be a part of a revival community. And we want to let you know that there is a new revival community that is going to be launching shortly. Derek, Shatisha, come on down. Come on down. 
you're our next contestant on Revival Communities. <laughs> They're going to share a little bit about the Revival Community that they are starting. Amen. Good morning, everyone. Happy New Year. We made it to 2021. Anybody excited about that? All right. I'm so sorry. I always bring some thunder when I get the mic. <laughs> Did you know I'm from New York? Now you know. All right. Okay. So um, our focus is on releasing the Father's heart in this neighborhood that we're currently in right now. All right, we're like, ooh, what does that mean? And many other outreaches um, throughout the city while enjoying one another's company and fellowship. Um, we're gonna focus on so many things, but the three things I wanna highlight is lifestyle evangelism. I'm gonna give the mic to um, D, Pastor D, and he will explain more. Um, a prayer gathering where we will get together and pray together, and then also break bread. So um, anybody like to eat? Amen. I like to eat too. So those are the three things that we're going to be focusing on in our revival community. And we're really excited about that. And we're going to be in this neighborhood. Okay. I don't know about you, but when I drive um, coming to Zion every other week, I'm so focused on those um, houses and those condos that we're driving past. Have anybody ever, you know, looked at those houses or condos, you know, and we want to invite those individuals to Jesus, those that don't have a relationship with Jesus. We want to invite them to church. So we're going to be going out in the community here locally in Powell, Ohio. Okay. So I'm going to give it to Mike, um, to Derek. <laughs> He's going to share more. Yeah, we'll be meeting here at Zion, but we're not uh, the church in the pews. We're the church on the move. Okay. So we're going to be here, but we're going to be out there. So make sure you bring your traveling shoes if you want to be a part of our group. And come put, ready to put your hand to the plow. We're going to do so many awesome things. But lifestyle evangelism, going out uh, and just being the, uh, the light, as, as we were talking this morning, going into the community and, uh, and expressing the love of the Father to the people at Walmart and Kroger's or Kmart or just in the community walking their dogs. You may be the first Jesus and the only Jesus that they ever meet. So let us, let's give them the authentic and the real thing. Amen. We're also going to be um, meeting. I don't know. Why did it do that? Oh, okay. We're also going to be um, um, at the table in the foyer. So if anyone's interested to learn more about our revival community, please come out. Um, and talk to us at the church. Yeah, that's great. So you're going to be meeting on Sunday mornings, right? Yes, yeah. yeah, Sunday mornings, those uh, the, the second and fourth Sunday, uh, and when there's a fifth Sunday. So they will be in the lobby. We'll be in the lobby as well at uh, 1030. So they, they'll be ten, between 10, 1030. They'll be here. They'll be in the um, lobby today to get more information. Brian and I will be in the lobby today if you need more information as well about other revival communities and getting connected. Yeah, so don't forget, Revival Communities, second and fourth Sundays, you definitely, definitely want to be a part. All right, so what do we got going on here with these tables? What is this? Is this just something cool and new and fresh? I don't know. Let's find out. I would love to welcome to the podium here, <laughs> Pastor Kim Bakers. Come on. Hey, hey. A little bit of wars going on with these things. Well, good morning, gang. Morning. Well, you guys look all so good. Sitting, it looks like a wedding reception or something here. I don't know. This is good. Um, ushers, we're gonna, probably going to need your help in helping people get seats here. And so if you, um, uh, let's just do this. If you have extra seats at your table, just raise your hand so they can just kind of get a view there. All right. So ushers, if you want to kind of just scan around a little bit there. And uh, you guys are going to get to meet some new friends today. So. So today I wanted to do something a little different. Is this mic sounding okay? <laughs> half yeses, half noes. All right. So uh, Adam, should I just switch to the handheld or should I keep going? Yeah, keep making an adjustment. That sounds good. Test one, test two. 
Mary's like, Jim, you never wear your sport coat. And so uh, I'm like, you know what? I'm going to make my wife's dreams come true. So, <laughs> she's so easy to please. All I had to do was put this on. So, uh, so that's why I'm dressed up a little bit today. All right, is that sounding better? Are we sounding good? All right, is it echoing, echoing, echoing? A little bit, a little bit? I just made that up. It's not doing that. He'll do it as I go. Okay, good. All right, so there we go. Just get it all out. Just let it out. So last quarter for CSSM, our Columbus School Supernatural Ministry, the quarter was on how to read the Bible supernaturally. And it's one of our favorite quarters. And uh, we just love helping people see how easy it is to read the Bible and how to do it with him. And so <clears throat> we had a lot of stuff going on with my dad. So I actually didn't, I was supposed to teach three sessions. I didn't get to teach any of them. And so I'm actually going to do one today. And if it goes well, we'll do another one next time. How's that sound? So we're going to kind of turn this into a little bit of a school. And so the sermon will be coming from you today as you read the Bible supernaturally. So I'm going to kind of lead you into it a little bit. And uh, everything is on your handout. So if you're watching us online, uh, did we, I believe we tried to post the handout. And then we're going to also have instructions. And so if you don't have the um, handout, at least get a Bible. And uh, it really helps to read the Bible supernaturally with a Bible. And so, um, but we, uh, hopefully we got a handout printed out. Look in the um, comment section. Uh, but there's probably a link in the description as well. So hopefully that's working. So let me just make a couple of statements about the Bible before we get going here. Again, it's just going to be kind of a brief teaching leading you right into, the, right into the, uh, the encounter with the scripture. The goal of all Bible reading is to meet the author. Now, a lot of, not, not a lot of people realize that. I think a lot of people think it's like to just like equip your head or to, you know, understand factual doctrine. But the, the goal of Bible reading is to read the author. Bible reading should lead to Bible experiences. One of the secrets of reading the Bible is as you're reading it, to read it as if those things could have happened to you if you were in those circumstances. A lot of times I think we read them in a galaxy far, far away, or it's like some type of mythology with Noah and the flood and those type of things, but they actually really happened. And so uh, one of the keys is uh, you want to read them as if it could have happened to you if you were in that same situation. Um, every verse in the Bible is an invitation to an encounter. Jesus told the uh, Pharisees, he says, you search the scriptures because in them you think you find eternal life, but these scriptures speak, to, but you refuse to come to me. So each one of these verses is supposed to lead us to Jesus. I'm just, gonna, I'm just hitting a couple of things here, okay? Um, the Bible is God speaking. Our reading is us listening and ready to respond. That's a powerful picture there. We're not just reading, you know, chapter a day keeps the devil away. We're not just trying to read through it so we feel better about ourselves. Uh, here's the last point I want to make, just real quick. Reading the Bible is a conversation between you and the author. Yeah. One of the pictures of meditation is, uh, is of, is, <clears throat> there's two pictures in the scripture of meditation. One is you're thinking, I don't know if you've ever been thinking about something so much, you begin to talk to yourself and you don't even realize that other people are listening. You guys ever done that? You're thinking, you're like talking to yourself about it. That's one of the pictures of, me of biblical meditation is you're, you're, you're thinking about it so much in your mind that you begin to mutter it out of your mouth. That's one of the pictures. The other picture of meditation is of, um, is of a dialogue where it's like, you know, like, Lord, I, you're, you're noticing something and what could this mean? And you're listening and there's this dialogue back and forth. So um, hopefully that just gives you a little bit different picture here. I mean, each one of those would have some major teaching points, but I wanted to just set the frame that this isn't just about reading the Bible out of religious duty and feeling better about ourselves. It's, it's unlike any other book because it's in the living word that you meet. It's in the written word that you meet the living word. All right, so here we go. So uh, one of the first times I taught this at Zion, there was a lady who had cataracts. And on the first act, of, you know, we're teaching about how to read the Bible supernaturally. And she had cataracts. And so as we're reading the scripture, she began crying. And, you know, sometimes you can't tell if it's like a good cry or a bad cry. You know, I'm like, okay. Like, what? I, I don't know what's happening here. I can't tell. And then she started laughing. I'm like, well, that's a, an improvement. And so um, her vision completely cleared up while reading the scriptures for the first activation. So that's not necessarily what we're going for in reading the Bible supernaturally, but we are all for it. And so there's an old saying, I'm sure you guys have heard of it. Um, all word and no spirit, you dry up. All spirit and no word, you blow up. When you have spirit and word, you grow up. All right? And so today we want to bring balance to the force. You know, I look at uh, word and spirit as like two wings of an airplane. How many of you guys realize you don't want to fly on like a one-winged airplane? Right? And I think so many churches that got that, they're word, 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 but there's no life on it. There's no Holy Spirit breathing on it. All it does is equip you to be a Pharisee to argue with people on Facebook. 
right? Because the Bible says, out of the abundance of the heart, Facebook speaks, right? <clears throat> but the Bible, is a, the Bible is a closed book without the Holy Spirit. You cannot dig information out. You cannot feed your spirit unless he breathes on it. The same Holy Spirit who breathed on the, on the writers of Scripture and inspired them, he's the same one that breathes on them as we read to them. We're, we're completely dependent upon him as we read, okay? You may be able to comprehend words on a page, but you won't have any spiritual understanding. So a lot of people, let's just use an example, they intellectually know that God loves them. Like they could quote uh, Romans 5 about how the Holy Spirit sheds abroad the love of God in their heart. They can get that concept, but the Holy Spirit is the one who makes it real. It's like the difference between reading a lecture on kissing and getting a big wet smacker right on the lips. One, you, you, can, you can study the Bible, you can listen to lectures, you can listen to how, you know, 2 Timothy is organized and all these things, but you need the Holy Spirit to come and make that experience real to you. Are we okay? Yeah. One last illustration, and then we're going to, um, I'm going to lead you into something here. And I've used this illustration before, but I really like it. Do you realize that you've never seen your face? Now, you may have seen a reflection in the mirror. You may have seen it in a picture or on a video or something, but you can't actually see your face. No one's got that big of a vision, right? And so um, it's interesting. The Bible says that the word of God, that the man who looks intently into the word of God is like a man who looks in the mirror and does not forget what he's seen. Actually, I'm going to read it rather than quote it. James 1, 23. For anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man who looks intently at his natural face in a mirror. For he, him, for he looks at himself and goes away and at once forgets what he was like. But the one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and perseveres, being, a hearer who for, who, being not a hearer who forgets, but a doer who acts, he will be blessed in what he is doing. When you got born again, you can't tell what happened in your spirit. You can't feel the salvation. You can't feel the reconciliation with God. You can't feel the forgiveness, right? Uh, you, you, can't, like, you can't just do it. You have to actually see it in the word of God. You have to be able to see it as in a mirror. The only way you can tell what happened in your born-again spirit is by seeing it in the word of God and the Holy Spirit making that real to you. And so I feel like as charismatics, this is an area where I think a lot of us can grow in is we love the feelings, we love the experience, we are, we're experiential, we taste and see that the Lord is good. We don't want to lower that, but we want to marry that to the immovable truth of God so that we're not moved by what we see, taste, hear, smell, or feel, we're only moved by what he says. How many of you guys have realized that your emotions are not the highest indicator of truth? Has anyone else figured that one out? And so, uh, yeah, and so the word of God, we want to be able to see what is actually true in the spirit realm. The Holy Spirit breathes on it and it comes into our experience. Okay, so let's go through this. The Bible is a divine book and it's a human book, okay? And so we're going to read it a little bit differently. Divine because the Holy Spirit inspired the authors. It's a human book because they weren't just typewriters. They were the Holy Spirit took over their hand and they wrote stuff down. It was actually their vocabulary, their circumstances, and so... Let's look at the divine side first of all. How do I know when God is speaking to me through the Bible? Uh, the first way is, did you have a question? How many of you guys have ever been reading the Bible and you had a question come to mind? Anybody ever have that happen? I'm here to tell you that the Holy Spirit is the one who's inspiring the questions because people who don't have questions don't recognize answers when they come. As long as you're asking questions, God is giving answers because he's the one inspiring the questions. Listen, guys, God loves it when you have questions. In the Gospel of Mark, there's 67 different episodes where there's some type of conversation. 50 of these 67 episodes, Jesus is asking questions. What did he do? He only said what he heard the Father say. What was the Father doing? He was continually asking questions. Uh, whose face is on the coin? Whose inscription is it printed with? Why do you call me good? What does Moses command you? By what authority did John the Baptist do what he did? Behind every question was not a, uh, a quest for information, but it was an invitation to a person. It was an invitation to know him and his heart and to, to connect with God in a real way. So he initiates the conversation. Listen to John 15, 15. Jesus said this, No longer do I call you servants, for the servant does not know what his master is doing, but I have called you friends. For all that I have heard from my Father I have made known to you. God shares revelation with his friends. And so that's what we're going after today. And uh, I've used this illustration a whole bunch, but do you guys remember Easter egg hunting? I'm not sure how the eggs ever got to be part of the resurrection. I, I still haven't figured that one out and stuff. But um, <clears throat> Easter egg hunting, the idea is to hide it 
part of the adventure is in the searching out, right? You don't hide it so the kids can never find it. You don't go bury it three feet in the backyard and be like, ah, kids, you'll never find it, right? Like you put it like, you know, like, like underneath the pillow of the couch or like maybe on top of the TV, right? And so you hide things for the kids, not from the kids, right? That's how revelation is with scripture. Uh, here's what Proverbs 25, 2 says. It is the glory of God to conceal a matter, but the glory of kings is to search out a matter. And God has made you children of the king. He has made you royalty. And so part of what we're doing here as kingdom royalty is we're recognizing that and we're going on an adventure with God because somehow as we're searching it out, it makes us become the kind of people who can carry the weight of the answer. And so a lot of times the way he does that is he inspires questions. And as we ask the Holy Spirit those questions, as we meditate on those things, we become shaped to be the kind of person because it said the Holy Spirit would guide you into all truth. It didn't say he would just tell you the truth. You don't just need facts. You need to be guided into this experience with truth so that when you, uh, the truth that sets you free, now you're able to set others free because it's actually become a part of you. He's not just trying to make you smarter. He's equipping you to become more like him. So one of the ways he does that is through asking questions. We're like halfway done with this first thing here. The second way you know if God spoke to you is did something stick out to you? Have you ever been reading the Bible and something just kind of jumps out at you and maybe you couldn't intellectually explain it? Like someone, you know, like you, I don't know, if you, um, I've been reading and it's like, oh, this is so good, but I have no idea why. I'll come and be like, Mary, you have to read this verse. She's like, what does it mean? I'm like, I have no idea, but I know there's a lot of juice on this. I know that there's something in this. And you can't dig it out with your mind, but your spirit's coming alive. How many of you have ever had that happen? Were you reading? Maybe you're like, you got a time of confusion and like you read a word and it brings a sense of peace, but you can't explain it, right? That's what we're talking about. That's that revelation uh, from, the, um, from the Holy Spirit. Revelation, a picture of something being revealed. Picture a curtain that's hiding something and then that curtain is pulled back and now you can see. Revelation is hidden in this realm called mystery. We see it in, throughout the book of Ephesians where Paul talks about the mystery realm, how things were revealed to him. And so that's where all the good stuff is. All the revelation is hidden in this mystery realm, and uh, your spirit sometimes comes alive to it, but your mind has not caught up to it yet. And so that's one of the ways you know the Holy Spirit. Those are the things that you're going to take, and you're going to meditate, and you're going to talk to him about, and he'll reveal those things to you over time, and you become the kind of person who can carry the answer. Are we okay? I think that's all I wanted to say on that. The Bible is always a revelation of Jesus. It's not just instructions for living life. I love how Paul prayed. He prayed for the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of Jesus. Because when we see him clearly, we see who we are clearly because we've been made one with him. He's not just somebody to admire. He definitely is, but he's someone to aspire to. He's someone the Holy Spirit is literally making us into his image. And so when we see him more clearly, we see us more clearly. I'll close with this statement, and then we're going to do our first activation. If you remove Jesus from the Bible, you have nothing. Literally, the whole thing's about him. Okay, it's not just a good book of doctrines and of good principles for living. Uh, they all fall apart without Jesus because you can't live them in your own strength. That was the whole Old Testament law. You couldn't do it in your own strength, right? So if you remove the, Jesus from the Bible, you have nothing. If you remove the Holy Spirit from reading the Bible, it can do more harm than good. Just ask the Pharisees. A lot of people are pushing Bible reading, Bible reading, Bible reading. It's actually making, I mean, I'm, my, my own, I, got, I know one guy who said he wanted to write a book called Why Are Christians So Mean? Jesus. You know why they are? Is because they're full of the Bible and they're not full of the Holy Spirit helping them read the Bible. There's a lot of people who are standing up for what's right in the wrong way and they look nothing like Jesus and there's a world who's saying we don't want any of that. So I'm not just pushing, read the Bible, read the Bible, read the Bible, read the Bible with the Holy Spirit. And that's what will actually do something for you. It's interesting, it seems like a lot of the churches today, they're pushing a Bible that the early church didn't have instead of the Holy Spirit who they did have. You guys got to realize the early church didn't have a Bible. They had the Old Testament scrolls in the temple that they went and heard read out loud once a week on the Sabbath. The New Testament hadn't been written yet. And yet they turned the world upside down because they had the Spirit of Christ living in them. Don't hear what I'm not saying. I'm not saying the Bible's not important. I'm saying the Bible without the Holy Spirit can do more harm than good. Yeah. Are we all right? All right, so let's do our first activation. You guys pull out your sheets there. We're going to do something with Psalm 27. 
So here's uh, the, the four steps. I think we got them on a slide. And, um, and so for those of you at home, if you do not have the action guide, that's, uh, it's hopefully in the comments or in the uh, uh, link somewhere. Here's the four steps here. And so uh, number one, invite the Holy Spirit to be your guide. And so I just like to just, uh, I, maybe this phrase will mean something to you, if it means a lot to me, helpless dependence. It just recognize I am helplessly dependent upon the Holy Spirit to reveal these things to me. I'm not smart enough to figure out the scriptures. And I don't even want to try to be smart enough. I just, Holy Spirit, I'm inviting you to be my guide. A lot of times I'll pray a prayer like this. Holy Spirit, you wrote this Bible. I pray that you would show me what it means. Okay? Um, look for something that jumps out to you. So I've got the actual text of Psalm 27. So you're going to read through it. And if something uh, jumps out at you, mark it. Circle it, underline it, put a star. However it is that you're going to mark it. Uh, number three, see if you have any questions that arise from reading it. Write those on the page somewhere. And then read it through a second time. Boy, as Americans, we love to just, we've never taken a speed reading course, but somehow when we get to Leviticus, we're like become these expert speed readers. <clears throat> the purpose of the Bible is not to get through it, but for it to get through you. All right, it's not a book to master, it's a book to be mastered by, to let these words shape your heart. And so we're not trying to get through these things quickly. And so we're actually going to take some time. And so um, the, the goal is not to be the first one to have it uh, finished uh, at your table. Okay, and so I know that, like you competitive types, I, I, I get it, but, um, and so there it is. And so you're going to be, invite the Holy Spirit, see if something jumps out at you, mark it, see if something, you got a question, write it down, and then do the same thing a second time. Any questions on the instructions? All right, I'll see you guys in, uh, let's just say 10 minutes, see you in 10 minutes. If we keep the conversations to a minimum so other people can read, it's hard to, hard to read when someone's talking.
One minute warning. All right, let's wind it down here. <clears throat> How many of you had something uh, jump off the page at you or you had a question come up? Anybody? All right, I would submit to you that you had God speak to you through the scriptures. So you walked in a little bit late. We're just uh, looking at how to read the Bible supernaturally. And uh, one of the ways you know God's speaking to you in scripture is if something jumps off the page at you. And uh, oftentimes that's revelation. Uh, your spirit comes alive, but your mind hasn't caught up. Or if you got a question, God's the one who inspires the questions. And so uh, just to give you a little look ahead, what if you set aside those questions or those things that jumped out at you and you meditated on those throughout the week? Like I think a lot of times we're just so into getting through the Bible, getting through the Bible when God's actually trying to speak to us and he wants us to actually stop and digest those things. Thank you, sweetheart. I appreciate that. <laughs> I received that. Here's what's going to happen if you do that. Revelation will hit you at the most inopportune moments. I'm not sure if you're real. I don't know if a guy like does it on purpose to see if you're like hungry enough to take it serious, but like you'll literally be in the middle of doing something and then it's just like a thought invades your mind and it's like, oh, whoa, that's, that's better than I could have come up with. And it's almost, I'll tell you this, the shortest pen is better than the longest memory. Take, take time and write those things down. Your journal isn't just like your dear Abby, dear diary type of thing. Your journal is your uh, record of God's voice speaking to you. And I tell you what, I, it's, it's good to just take those times, even if you got to put it in your phone and then go write it down in another place later. Um, uh, but uh, revelation will happen in the mis most inopportune moments. And if you take time and write it down, God will give you more revelation. When you steward what he gives you, he unveils more to you. When you don't take serious what he gives you, you're like, man, I don't feel like God's speaking to me anymore. Because you're not doing anything with what he has to say. How are we doing? Another thing that's going to happen is when you're talking to somebody, you're going to find that the things that God is showing you is perfect for what they need right then. It's like, it's, I don't know, it's like, I remember when Mary and I were like, uh, we did this thing where we read uh, a book of the Bible once a day for 30 days. And so we split the New Testament into like 36 different chunks. Some of the longer books like Matthew, we did like Matthew 1 through 7, once a day for 30 days. Matthew 8 through 14, once a day for 30 days. And it was amazing that whatever book we were kind of studying in, 
uh, whoever we were talking to on the phone, it was like, that's just what they needed. And you're just going to find that it's like, it's like just in time wisdom that God's teaching. You're going to see, oh man, some other people need this too. And that's just kind of the beauty of how it works. All right, here's what I want you to do. <clears throat> I want you to get in groups of two or three, since you, I guess your tables are at about six, and so you can divide it in half or whatever you want to do. And um, just share what hit you out of the passage. You don't have, this isn't a time to teach. You don't have to like give some big explanation on things like that. Just maybe the words or phrases that stuck out at you or maybe a question that you had, okay? And so if you, uh, you, know, if you didn't really get to do the exercise that much, just say, hey, I'm just, just getting into it. You don't have to share. But uh, if you did get to, uh, let's just take a few minutes and um, extroverts be sensitive to that other people might want to participate in this as well. You know who I'm talking about. Yeah, you. Yes, you. So uh, just, just share something that hits you or a question that came up. Go ahead. And those of you who are watching online, go ahead and put it in the chat. Uh, what it was, something, that question that came up or something that hits you?
All right, we'll take about another 60 seconds and then we'll bring it back. All right, let's see if we can bring it back together. Just so you guys know, on the next activation, you're going to be reading an entire book of the Bible. It's 3 John. It's only like a dozen verses, but still, doesn't that just sound amazing? What did you guys do at scripture, uh, church day? We read an entire book of the Bible. Would you guys only read a couple verses? All right, so I made a statement that the the Bible is a divine book and it's a human book. It's a divine book because it was the Holy Spirit who influenced the human authors. But it's a human book because they were actually human authors. They were real people with real emotions and real circumstances. And so let uh, let me just make this statement. The Bible was written for you, but it was not written to you. Okay? Like, when Paul was writing his letter to the church in Philippi, the book of Philippians... He wasn't thinking about you. There was actually a church in Philippi with real people that he greeted by name, right? And so, boy, I don't know if I want to use this illustration. Let's just say that. It was, it was a real book written to real people, but it's all, so it's timely, but it's also timeless. Uh, 2 Timothy 3.16 says, All scripture is God-breathed and is profitable for doctrine, for correction, for training in righteousness, Right? And so it was written for us, but it was actually a group of people that were actually written to. So because of that, we got to kind of bridge the gap a little bit. And so God has spoken to us through a book. And I want you to notice, God didn't speak to you through a vision. Now, God can speak through visions, but listen, you do not want to base your destiny, your faith on just a vision. Visions can be forgotten, can be misconstrued. Some of you would be like, I would rather have a vision than read the Bible. Some of you guys are like that. Here's what happened. I remember I had a dream a little while ago. I wrote it down. And a couple weeks later, I was describing the dream to somebody. And it felt really powerful and really real. I went back and read it. And I'm like, man, I got so much of that dream wrong. There was parts that I had embellished and there was parts that I had diminished. See, that's what happens when we just use our memories. We just go from an experience to an experience. Sometimes our remembrance of that experience isn't 100% correct. So God gave us a book that we could go back to with something written down that isn't subject to just our memories, right? I mean, you even try to like quote a verse sometimes and you go back and read it. You're like, whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> guys got some parts of that one wrong there, right? So God has spoken to us through a book. Now that may seem, ob- seem obvious, but it's going to be the foundation of everything else that I'm going to say today. Um, When God said, I'm going to speak through a book, you're never going to get anywhere in hearing God's voice in the Bible until you understand that it's a book, and it needs to be read like a book, like you would read just about any other book, okay? So here's how some people miss it as a book. You're like, Jim, I know it's a book. I already know that. Well, here's how some people miss it is, uh, let's just call it, um, I I remember when I first became a Christian, people told me that I needed to, uh, I had to read a few verses every day, and they actually gave me a time limit. It was 15 minutes. I don't know, it didn't matter where I started or where I ended up, as long as I had those 15 glorious minutes in the Bible, right? Um, Another way they put it to me is, I'll read a chapter a day. How many of you guys heard that? You got to read a chapter a day. You know, a chapter a day keeps the devil away. It was like the vitamins of the Christian faith, right? Listen, if I sent you a letter and you're like, you know what? If I read a sentence a day, then it's going to keep the devil away. If I read a sentence a day, I'm going to know what this means. Listen, if you read a sentence out of a letter once a day for 30 days, you would have no idea what that letter was talking about. 
That's not how letters were meant to be read. Just a little piece here and take a couple days off and come back and maybe I'll start in the middle of the letter. Like that's how people start in the Bible. I'll just, I was going to pick something out and just pick something out in the middle. Guys, there was an actual book and it has an actual context. Okay. I use this as an example of context. Um, Sean's going to hate me for this one, but I'm just going to go ahead and do it. What does this sentence mean? Sean O'Rourke is hot. <laughs> what, what does that sentence mean? Well, if, um, if his fist is pulled back and he's getting ready to punch somebody, it means one thing. If he's on the cover of Sports Illustrated for having a 100-game winning streak in tennis, it means something else. If uh, a nurse is taking a, th- a temperature and pulls out a thermometer and that's the caption, it means something else. If he's on People Magazine's Sexiest Pastor Alive uh, list, it means something else. <laughs> you cannot know what Sean O'Rourke is hot means just by the statement, yet that's how many people read the Bible. They just pull some statement out. You can't know what it means unless you know the context. Every verse of scripture has a context. A context, a text without a context is just a con. And that's how many cults get started. Say it again. Good morning, everybody. Happy New Year. Yay. A text without a context is just a con. And so, uh, boy, if you want to just uh, frustrate a cult, um, have them quote a verse to you and say, hey, let's just read a couple verses before that, a couple verses after that. And it's like, whoa, that has nothing to do. Uh, one example is there are three levels of heaven, you know, the Mormon doctrine of the three levels of heaven. They get it from 1 Corinthians 15. And it says that, um, uh, it says uh, the, the sun has one level of glory, the moon, and then the stars. And they're like, see three levels of heaven. And you read it, and it's talking about how our... Um, our bodies are perishable, but they will be raised imperishable. And how just like the bodies in heaven have different levels of glory, so our, our earthly bodies and our heavenly bodies will have different levels of glory. It has nothing to do with heaven. It has everything to do with an analogy between what our earth... You see what I'm saying? You just read a little bit of context. So you have to read it like a book. How are we doing? A book is meant to be read right through so you get the feel of it. Um, okay. No self-respecting Star Wars fan would start with episode one. You You would start with where it starts, at episode four. And you wouldn't start in the middle, right? You wouldn't start like uh, at the Battle of Hoth and Empire Strikes Back on the Ice Planet, right? With the Tauntauns walking. No, no, you wouldn't start there. You would start in that opening scene where Vader's boarding the boarding fight. Like, you would start it in, like, no one starts the movie in the middle. Hey, let's just start in chapter 13. Because that's not how movies are meant to be viewed, but that's how we read the Bible oftentimes. Let's just start in chapter 10. I'm not trying to be mean. I'm trying to help us. Are we okay? All right. Another way people miss the um, Bible as a book is they have a goal of reading the Bible through every year. Listen, that's not a bad thing, but you can get through 66 books of the Bible and have never read the Bible. Just because you're reading words on a page doesn't mean you've ever stopped to let God speak to you and to meditate on those things and let them become uh, food for your body and strength for your life by putting them into practice. Listen, guys, it's good to read the Bible for long periods, long stretches to get, a, to get the breadth of it, but um, you're only acclimating yourself to the Bible. You're not actually reading it. Uh, the person who sits down and reads through the Bible once a year, every year, you've missed the point. The point isn't to get through the Bible. The point is to have the Bible get through you. One of my favorite teachers on the planet is Andrew Womack, and um, Mary and I got to have a, a meal with him one time, name drop, name drop. And um, I said, Andrew, what does your Bible study look like? You're just such, you know, I'm, just, I'm such in awe of his, of his teaching. He said, well, you're not going to like my answer. I'm like, try me. And he said, well, for the last year, I've meditated on Ephesians chapter 4, verses 20 through 24 for one year. And he said it's been the richest year of his life. I was thinking... That sounds boring, like, like, like five verses for a year. And, uh, but uh, he said it, had been the, it, was a, it was the richest year of Bible study of his life. I just say that just to challenge us because we get through this thing, we got to rush through it and read through it when God's like, listen, there's gold in here, different seasons of your life, and I want you to slow down so I can speak to you and meditate on these things so it becomes strength. How are we doing? Another way people... Um, miss the, uh, the Bible as a book, is they never read it without books or study aids or commentaries, okay? Listen, books have their place. I got over 3,000 books to help me study the Bible in my library. I got all sorts of stuff in there. I love that. But if I read those first or I read them too quickly, I'm letting someone else speak into what the Bible is saying before I give God a chance to speak into what the Bible is saying. 
Even study notes on, on, in, uh, in, in your Bible, those, those can be good, but don't read them too quickly. Give God a chance. Listen, if you are born again, your spirit and his spirit have become one spirit. You can hear from God. You can have those questions come up in the text that he will answer as you, as you carry those questions over time. He will answer them. At inter-opportune moments, let me just say that. But um, I'm saying you come to the Bible without a commentary beside you, no book. Um, so the first place is you in the Bible. Then the second place is you in the Bible. And then the third place is you in the Bible. Then you can bring in something else. But give God a chance to speak. Just go through those scriptures. Another way that people miss the Bible as a book is when you come to the Word of God and you just open it. You know, I mean, it's just it's like a magic book of spells. It's just like, because it's the Bible, if I open it and I just kind of, boom, there it is. Like, there, there's my answer. It, it, you could do that with a cookbook. You're like, well, Jim, God's used it before. He's also used a donkey, but not many of us are going to donkeys to try to get our uh, advice from uh, wisdom for the future. Give me two eons if it's, if, if it's your will, Lord. <laughs> Just because God can speak that way doesn't mean he's chosen to reveal himself through a book that way. Are we okay? The Bible's not a microphone. It's not a book of magic spells where you just open it up. And because it's the Bible, it's more magical. And whew. Some of you are getting mad at me. Some of you are learning something. Are we all right? So it's not, I, I get very disturbed when people are using the Bible as a magic book or a crystal, spa, a crystal ball. Just open it and see what God has to say. So, all right. So I come back to my original statement that God has chosen to speak in a book. So if he has uh, chosen to speak to us through a book, here's a couple of things. Um, I got to understand, the Bible was not originally written in English. How many of you guys realize that? I know the King James people, you'd think that, uh, you know, Paul spoke, uh, thee that I say unto thou, but the, the, that's not how it was. If I, if I got a letter from a friend in France and it's translated to me in English, there's going to be certain things he says that even though it's translated into English, it's good to recognize that it came from a French head. Right? Those French people, they just look at life a little bit differently. And you don't have to understand French and be able to translate it yourself, but it's good to recognize, you know what, this came from a different uh, viewpoint. When it comes to the Bible, I have to realize the Old Testament was primarily written in Hebrew. And Hebrew culture, they just uh, looked at things a little bit differently. It's uh, mostly a word picture language. And so you don't need to become an expert in Hebrew. Just recognize, you know what? They did things a little differently. So uh, in Hebrew, they would, say, um, uh, they would say that he covered his ears. And that's a word picture way of saying that he didn't listen. And so you would get it translated. So sometimes some, some translations may see that they, they hardened their hearts or they, they covered their ears. And just recognize it's a word picture language. All right? Uh, the New Testament is written in Greek. Galatians 4.4 4 says, In the fullness of time God sent his son. It's interesting that uh, the gospel, uh, Jesus didn't come to the earth until there was the Roman roads. Literally every road in the world led back to Rome. So the gospel could be spread across the, across the, universe, across the, the known world at that time. They, uh, everyone spoke Greek. <laughs> you know, the Romans had uh, conquered every province, and so they could go and they could speak Greek and basically uh, evangelize the entire earth. And so Greek is an interesting language. Because salvation is so multifaceted, Greek has a shade of meaning for every little thing. If you've ever studied Greek, it is a very technical language. And so just know that, boy, the Bible has a way of describing exactly what happened. Um, I'm just going to go through these real quick. Uh, number two, the manners and customs of the Bible days are often different than ours. Okay, so when I'm speaking to you in church, I'm assuming you guys came in cars and not donkeys, right? But was, uh, we just have to, you know, they cooked food differently. They lived in houses differently. They, they, the way they did family differently, you know, when they got, oh, here's something a little different. Maybe it's not different for you, but um, when, uh, when they got married, they added on a room to the house so the, the, uh, the son and the new daughter-in-law lived in the same house. The house just expanded. <clears throat> okay. I'm not implying anything, boys, but we do like having you around. Uh, the Bible is written in real historical situations which are part of what God is speaking to us. Um, so Jeremiah and Daniel and Isaiah, there was a, there was a history going around. Um, you know, the, uh, the, the Old Testament had the great moves of the Assyrian and Babylonian empires. You don't have to become an expert in history, but just know that there was world powers going on. And Israel was sometimes in slavery to these, sometimes they were ruling over them. And uh, God chose that history to be that way so that he could speak to his people. He's like, you know what? This situation would be perfect for me to give this message. Uh, number four, within that history, certain people were in very specific circumstances. Are we okay here? I know this is a little bit different. All right. 
very specific sermon. So, uh, Paul was thrown in jail. And unless Paul had been thrown in jail, we wouldn't have a lot of the New Testament. And so it's good to know Paul was writing in prison. Now, it's not going to like make or break some things, but just recognizing what, this is a book written by a human being who was in a real circumstance. Uh, in the Old Testament, Jeremiah would have never been spoken what he said unless he'd been living those few years before Jerusalem fell to Babylon. Daniel would have never written a word unless he'd been taken captive uh, as a prisoner of war to Babylonia. Uh, the whole of Ezekiel was written because a man was taken captive, all right? Uh, number five, the Bible is written in certain countries with a certain geography. Again, if, um, if I wrote my friend uh, uh, in Africa a letter and I mentioned the Ohio River, you know, it might help him to look up on a map and see what the Ohio River looked like, just, just to get a picture of it. You don't have to become an expert on languages or customs or history or geography, but just recognize, okay, some of these things. And so if you see something that you don't recognize in the Bible, just Google it. They're going to have a map, they're going to have a picture, and it'll just help you get a little bit picture for the things that, like if we said, um, you know, hey, I'll meet you at Panera. Like most people would know Panera is like right at the corner here, right? Or at, at the, um, you know, at OSU. Like we, we, we all know what that means, right? And so there's things in the Bible that they all knew what it meant that to us were like, hold on, that's a little bit different. And so it's just helpful to look those things up. Are we all right? All right. Now, sometimes people giving you more information than you need is, is, is hurtful. So I remember when um, uh, Dark Knight Rises came out. You guys remember the second Batman movie, Christopher Nolan, where Bane was the bad guy? Am I all alone here? Thank you very much. And so I was worried because I knew in the comics that Bane broke Batman's back, and in some versions of the comic, he killed Batman. And I'm like, I'm not going to see a movie where Batman dies. Like, I'm not going to do this. And so I remember the, um, you know, the critics, they, uh, you know, they get to see the movies in advance. And we, were, we had already bought our tickets. We we're going to go see Dark Knight Rises. And somehow I accidentally wound up in a website that had spoilers on it. I don't know how it happened. And so I'm reading it, because I wanted to see if Batman died. Because if he died, I'm like, I'm not going to watch Batman die. And so I'm reading it, and so I read too much, okay? And so I went, and as I'm watching the movie, it was, uh, it was good, but it was like I already, had, I already knew some of the parts. It was like, ah, eh, it just wasn't as good. Versus when I saw um, Man of Steel. <laughs> oh, my goodness. I was about out of breath at the end of that movie. I didn't know what was coming. I didn't know the ending fight between him and Zod. They were going to destroy the city. It was just absolutely... Is anyone here with me? What is... Look... I had a whole different experience with Man of Steel because I just let it hit me. I didn't read any of the reviews. We saw it opening day. It was absolutely wonderful, okay? I think that reading the Bible somewhere in between those things because it is a different book. If you, just, if you don't know anything, you don't have any kind of orientation, you just read it, sometimes it's a little bit difficult because some of the things are so different. It's like, hold on, this guy's trying to get his, you know, Sarah's trying to get his... Uh, her husband to marry the servant and have a baby with her. Like, that doesn't make any sense. You know, just like some of these stories are so different from us. We don't understand. I think it's helpful to have a little bit of orienting information versus, uh, but not too much where it kind of tells you all the stuff. So let me just use this as an illustration. Uh, there's, a, um, po- there's a real powerful hymn of the church uh, called It Is Well With My Soul. Let me just read you a piece of it. When peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, Whatever my lot, thou hast taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul. How many of you guys have heard that song? Let me give you a little bit of the background of that song and see if it gives you a little bit more punch about what it was talking about. Ready? This hymn was written after several traumatic events in John Spafford's life. He was the author of the song. The first was the death of his only son in 1871 at the age of four, shortly followed by the Great Chicago Fire, which ruined him financially. He had been a successful lawyer and had invested significantly in property in the area of Chicago, which was decimated by the Great Fire. So lost his son, lost his business. His business interests were further hit by the economic downturn of 1873, at which time he had planned to travel with his family on the SS Ville de Hoeve. <clears throat> That's exactly how it's pronounced. In a late change of plan, he sent the family ahead while he was delayed on business concerning zoning problems following the Great Chicago Fire. While crossing the Atlantic, the ship with his family on it sank rapidly after a collision with a sea vessel, and all four of Spafford's daughters died. His wife, Anna, survived and sent him the now-famous telegram, it just was two words, saved alone. 
Shortly afterwards, as Spafford traveled to meet his grieving wife, he was inspired to write these words as his ship passed near where his daughters had died. So he's literally on the ship right where his daughters died. The Holy Spirit comes on and begins to write these words. When peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot thou hast taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul. Now, how many would agree that just having that little bit of orienting information about what the song was about has the song have a little bit more punch, right? So I believe that's possible with the scriptures is we've got gifted teachers for centuries now that have been studying the Bible and archaeology has dug up backgrounds and all just sorts of awesome things. And there's some simple resources. And so I'm going to introduce you to one or two of them here that it just gives you a little bit of the information and helps you understand. We're going to do third John and a little bit more, but I don't want it to give you two more where it's giving like the spoiler alerts like Dark Knight Rises, but I think if you just go into a cold, how many of you guys have read the Bible and you're like, I don't even know what this is talking about. It's just a little bit difficult. Is anyone brave enough to admit that? Okay, we got one person. Yeah, thank you for that. <laughs> all, y'all, all the rest of you, I don't know. Maybe it's just me, but it's just helpful to know. Here's a little bit about what was going on. Here's a little bit, a couple of the themes that are happening. It just helps you read a little bit more because the Bible was written for you, but it wasn't written to you. So the people that it was written to, what did they already know? And so just to have that help you. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to do an activation with 3 John. Again, you're going to read the entire book. I think it's like a dozen verses. What I want you to notice is I've got it written out there for you without the chapters and verses. My favorite way to read the Bible is without chapters and verses. There's a, um, I've got it in the, in the footnotes there for you. There's a, a, there's a um, translation called the Books of the Bible, NIV, And it takes out the chapters and verses. And so at the bottom of the page, it'll say like, you know, chapter one, verse one through chapter two, verse three on that page. So you can kind of get oriented to it if you're going to try to find it. But I like to read it that way because when you read it with chapters and verses, it almost reads like a bad technical manual. Da, 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 stop. Da, 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 stop. Chapter stop here. Like, you know what I'm saying? It's just, it's continually telling you to, to break the action. That's not how you read a book. You curl up with the book and you get lost in it. And that's how the Bible is meant to be read. Is it just not to know when to stop. It's just you're getting lost and caught up in it rather than, I got six more verses before I can stop this chapter. There's a difference. I'm telling you, it's, uh, it's, it's a powerful difference. So here's what you're going to do is you're going to, um, let's put up the slide for the activation. There we go. So you're going you're to pray and invite God to be your guide. You're going to read the book with the author. I can't overemphasize this enough to just before you read, just to slow down and say, Holy Spirit, help me here. And I like, to, I like to say you become him like a helpless child. Um, you're going to read through the whole book in one sitting. So you're just going to read it, uh, read it as if you were a church leader receiving a letter from your friend, the Apostle John. That's actually the context there, okay? After reading the whole book through once, when I say whole book, remember, it's like 12 verses or something like that, okay? Um, you're going to read, the, there's something called an invitation to Third John. This is the book introduction in the books of the Bible. So remember that translation I told you about that has uh, no chapters and verses? They give these great little book intros that just kind of help you set up. And so you're going so to read uh, 3 John. Then you're going to read the intro, and then you're going to read 3 John again. All right? A second time. Number five, you're going to read specific advice for reading 3 John. It's another resource that I like that just uh, gives you some hints on how to, uh, let's, let's just say someone said four score and seven years ago. Well, we'd all think about uh, Lincoln's address, right? We begin to pull up the history of, of slavery and all those type of things. And so what this reading, this specific reading does, is it fills in those blanks what everybody else knew. It just kind of gives you a little... I'm just trying to introduce you to some resources that help you read a little bit better. Are we okay? I'm not trying to turn us into Bible scholars. I want us to spend the time in the Bible. But what I found is just these little bit of things, they just help you understand because it was not written to you, but it is written for you. And I think these things help. And you're going to read 3 John one more time, and you're going to answer the discussion questions. And the discussion questions are, um, what differences did reading some background material to 3 John make in your understanding? And what did God speak to you through this exercise? We're not looking for right or wrong answers. We're looking for your, uh, in, in, your reaction to this exercise. And it doesn't have to be like glowing reviews. Maybe you liked it, maybe you didn't. I hope that you do. Okay, so this one's going to take a little bit. So any uh, questions on the instructions? Okay, so those of you online at, at home, um, I, ho- I hope you can get the, uh, the, these book introductions. If not, um, just pull up 3 John and pull up a 3 John book introduction and just uh, use one of those on- online. I'm sure they've got something on there. Use uh, J. Vernon McGee, um, his uh, walk through the Bible. He'll have a great introduction there. All right, we good? All right, so 
Tune in with the Holy Spirit. Read 3 John. Read the introduction. Read 3 John. Read specific advice. Read 3 John. Then you guys will be back together at your tables. All right, let's take about 15 minutes for that.
How many already finished the exercise? All right. Let's take about three more minutes then. And those of you who finished before the other people, just don't wrestle with pride too much. So just... Let's take one more minute. Let's call time. How'd you guys do? All right. All right. All right. Good. I like hearing that. Good. And so um, let's do this. And so why don't you just at your tables, there's two discussion questions. What differences did reading some background material to 3 John make to your understanding? And what did God speak to this exercise? Again, God speaking probably looked a lot like a question coming up or maybe something that was highlighted to you. I know 3 John's a little bit of a weird book, but I wanted to do a short book. And so... Uh, all right, so why don't you guys take a few minutes to the table, and then we'll wrap it up.
Let's take about another 30 seconds and then we'll bring it together here. All right, let's bring it back together here. How many of you guys enjoyed this today? How many of you guys hated it today? All right. How many aren't going to raise your hand no matter what I say? Thank you. That's good. All right, a, a quick wrap up here. If you'll notice, uh, there's, a, there's two footnotes on there. One is for um, the books of the Bible, NIV. And so uh, if you just buy these two resources, you'll have everything that um, I use today. And so the books of the Bible, NIV, that's the translation that has no um, chapters and verses, but it also has those book introductions, the invitation to 3 John. So every book of the Bible have an invitation. It's got a really great one on the Old Testament, one on the New Testament. And uh, I, just, I just think they're the best I've seen and just keeping it simple without feeling like you're in a seminary uh, going through that. So that one resource is actually a Bible, but it's got great introductions and then the second resource is How to Read the Bible Book by Book by Gordon Fee and Douglas Stewart. And so um, yeah, you'll see that on the footnotes as well. So if you just got those two, so that actually um, is a little bit more in-depth for each book of the Bible, and uh, that one's enjoyable too. It's, uh, yeah, so that, th those two books would get you, um, I, I think it would help you get pretty far, because I was just talking to um, Beth, and she was like, it's so overwhelming, all the numbers of resources, and I agree. So just those two I, I think would be really good. And uh, maybe next time I'll recommend one more. And so, uh, all right. Well, I hope you guys enjoyed that. And, uh, you, know, I, you know, we could do this. I, let's do it again on the third Sunday. And so we're, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go a little bit different level with it. And uh, it's good to be back. And so we're going we're gonna to do a, uh, more of an abbreviated worship, but it's still going to be good. And so I'm turning it over to, uh, what was it? Sean. Yeah, I was going to say, I was trying to think of what I said. Nope. Yeah. Move on. Nope. Um, <laughs> So, uh, so what you guys are holding is that handout. I encourage you guys, like, take it home. Take a picture of it because you can kind of practice that art, that, that space of reading the Bible supernaturally. So that handout's yours. We have a couple of things we want to do uh, today. Uh, so a couple events and updates. Uh, we have, if you're new here, if you're new today, you're like, what in the world did I walk into? Everyone's at tables and chairs. There's a card behind you in the seat behind you, in, in your, the back of your seat. Uh, it's a connect card, and we would love to connect with you. So if you're here, you're new, we would love to connect with you, and in a moment, you're going to see buckets that are going around for our offerings. Uh, and we would love if you could fill that out and throw it in the offering uh, bucket. And also, if you did change your email address in 2020, most people don't, but if you did, could you update that card as well? Let us know your new contact information because you're going to get giving statements for 2020 here over the next couple weeks, and we want to make sure it gets to you. So if you change your address, location, phone number, email address, fill one of those cards out uh, when, the, when the buckets come around. So, all right, we're going to do offering. You guys ready? Okay, so if I can have the declarations uh, in a moment here, we're, these are the ways to give. Uh, you can give on our app. It's amazing. It takes just a few moments to set up, and then it's a secure uh, portal for online giving. You can give with our app. Uh, you can also give with checks, uh, and there's going to be a slide here in a moment, maybe. Yes. Yes. In Jesus' name, we just... Mm, there it is. Awesome. Give online. Give by check. Uh, give in cash as well. There's envelopes in the seats uh, in, it, blah, behind you, in the seat back behind you. I can't say in the seat in front of you. This is throwing me off today. Um, but also, if you want to give to the Normandy Project, we're still taking donations. And so go ahead and make those checks payable. Uh, you're going to see everyone coming around with buckets. They're going to put out your table and wait awkwardly until you put money in. I'm just kidding. I just always thought that would be funny and terrible. Um, so let's do some declarations. Why don't you guys stand up with me as we declare these together? 
All right. As we receive today's offering, we're believing the Lord for resources for new businesses, throne room answers to city problems, city transformation, supernatural courage to slay giants, evangelism eruptions, positions and promotions, multiple streams of income, land building houses and vineyards, irresistible influence, witty inventions, glory explosions in my workplace, groundbreaking ideas, surprising encounters, angelic assistance to boldly go where no one has gone before. May God be gracious to us and bless us and make his face to shine upon us, that your way may be known on earth, your saving power among all nations. Breakthrough, no limits. Awesome. We can invite the worship team to come on up as the buckets are going around right now. I'm going to give you guys a couple quick uh, event updates. So uh, if you're new, again, uh, if you're listening online, you can text 614-333-1101 uh, to uh, text connect to that number. We love to connect with you. Also, did you guys know that phone number, 614-333-1101? If you were to lead someone to Jesus on the streets in central Ohio, have them text Jesus to that number. And we have systems we've built over the last year that anyone who, who gives their life to Jesus, maybe you're uh, on the side of the street and you don't want to just get them saved, you want to get them connected, give them this phone number, text Jesus to 614-333-1101. And we have a whole system to get them connected to Apprentice of Jesus. We'll connect with them. We'll reach out to them. We'll help them get connected to a revival community group. We'll get them to church. We'll, we'll get them even to our ministry school environment. So just it's a resource that if you're in Central Ohio, you can do it anywhere. So it's awesome. Um, okay, okay, so a couple of quick event updates. Uh, we have, uh, if you... If you've recently given your life to the Lord, we also have baptisms here. And sign up online. Check it out. Uh, we love doing baptisms. So you can uh, sign up online again. Uh, if you've recently given your life to the Lord, it's an important next step uh, in our relationship with Jesus. Okay, you guys still okay? We good? We have the Columbus School of Supernatural Ministry starting up in a few weeks. It's going to be on January 24th. And this quarter is about hearing God's voice and developing a prophetic lifestyle. Now, I don't know about you, but hearing God's voice for me is the most essential fabric of my relationship with Him. We hear God's voice when we read scriptures. We hear God's voice when His Spirit is speaking to us about our day. We hear God's voice to, to tell us to go left or right. We also hear God's voice and get to partner with Him to prophesy, to learn how to, to change and shift environments, to learn how to release the kingdom of God. You know, 1 Corinthians 14.1 says, follow the way of love and eagerly desire spiritual gifts, especially that you may prophesy. So this next quarter is our prophetic training for the church as well. Come to this quarter. We're going to go through the whole prophetic training, plus an additional few weeks of activations, uh, of awakening God's voice in your life so that you can release God's voice in the world around you. January 24th is when it starts. And finally, on February 6th, we have an art day. So if you're an artist, you want to come out, Ruth Ann Kramer, one of our artists, you guys can see artwork all over the back of the sanctuary. Uh, some of our artists do this. You'll see them up here. This is going to be a time on February 6th. You can come out and, and practice painting, practice expressing your worship, your, your creativity to the Lord. And it's going to be an awesome day. So February 6th, you guys can, can come out for that. All right, you guys good? I can't see any of you, but I believe you're still there. So why don't you guys come forward? We're just going to end today with some worship. We want to end our time together in just the presence of the Lord and see who he is in, in our spirits as we've seen who he is in the word. So this front area is called the river. You're welcome to come forward. You can stay where you are, but I encourage you to come on forward uh, as our worship team leads us right now in some worship.
start singing out your own song to the Lord. Let's fill the atmosphere with just praise because he's worthy.
leads you the marriage of the Lamb to come and worship Him. Celebration. It's the joining of the bride and the son. The two becoming one. Sing that again. What an honor to be invited to the marriage of the Lamb, to come and worship Him. Celebration, it's the joining of the bride and the son, the two becoming one. All oh, the prophecies fulfilled. In a moment, we see I pour many waters like the sound of rolling thunder. Hallelujah! Give him glory. Declaring 
King Jesus, he is faithful. King Jesus, you are faithful. King Jesus, you are faithful. King Jesus, you are faithful.
have overcome. We just look into 2021, God, and we look to partner with you. Well, let this be a year that we partner with you in a way that we never have before, at a level we never have before. Lord, we're filled with hope. Lord, we just thank you that your heart is to see a city saved. Your heart is to see families saved, healed and restored, finances provided, missions funded. So, Lord, we look into 2021, God. We look into it with you, with your eyes. We pray for revival in our country. <laughs> Lord, revival in our political system. Revival in our government. Lord, let your kingdom come and your will be done. Lord, thank you for the reminder of your coming. Thank you that you are the blessed hope. This life is not all that there is, God. Let us get our eyes, keep them on you. So Lord, I bless your people to take your message, to take your goodness to take the seeds that were planted in your word and let them grow and bear fruit and strength. So we give you this day. We bless your name in the name of Jesus. Amen. Well, yeah, yeah, yay God. It was good. Well, bless you guys. There's plants in the middle of the table. We had a florist that donated all those to us. And so pick somebody at the table, take it home with you. If there's any trash, if you could help us pick it up, that'd be great. We bless you guys. We'll take see the you. Food too. What? Take, take the food from your table. Yeah, take the food from your table, and uh, we'll see you on the third Sunday. Bless you guys.